when a comrade falls in Latin America or the Mediterranean or a good part of the world these days, they're honored at such tributes by a presente. That is by saying, presente, you are here. You are here with us. So please, everyone stand for a second, please. We'll just do three quick presentes for Howard Zinn. Howard Zinn, presente. Howard Zinn, presente. Howard Zinn, presente. Well, welcome, welcome. In the summer of 1970, I wandered into a radical bookstore in Washington, D.C. Ironically, I'm still in one. But I wandered into a radical bookstore in Washington, D.C. And I look back now, I thought it was pretty, un I thought it was pretty hip and cool and cognizant of the world around me at the time, but I was a kid. And I was browsing the shelves and I came across a book by a guy by the name of Howard Zinn, who's, you know, it was just foreign to me at the time. And I started thumbing through it, a book called The Politics of History, which is, preceded the people's history of the United States by a good 20 years. And it was an eye-opener for me. And, and I can't help to think that it set me on a path, uh, well, at least it, end, it ended up for me. I'm still in radical bookstores. But it was an education, an eye-opener for me, and it's still in print. A number of years later, in the early 80s, I was introduced to Howard Zinn by my teacher, Harvey Goldberg. And Harvey Goldberg, uh, Howard was passing through town and hooked up with Howie, with uh, Harvey. And I had the good fortune that he, Harvey invited me to lunch. And that was the first kind of person-to-person -person encounter I had with Howard Zinn. There I am sitting at a lunch table with Howard Zinn and Harvey Goldberg. Well, so that led to another thing. You know, After Harvey passed, it was the creation of the, the Goldberg uh, Center in the History Department. And on its second lecture in the late 80s, Howard Zinn came and filled the Union Theater, and I, and I had the privilege to introduce Howard at that time to a, uh, a packed audience at the Union Theater. And he since came back on number, numbers of occasions to the Orpheum uh, and to the Monona Terrace last year. Uh, so he really had a deep connection to Madison that you'll learn more about as, as we go on. It's nice to see so many people here today to pay homage to Howard Zinn, who loved Madison love speaking here at the Union or at the Orpheum or at MATC or at uh, Monona Terrace, as we saw there. And uh, he had so much uh, influence on so many of us here, not only here in this room, but uh, really all over the country and internationally, too. Uh, he was a teacher. He was our teacher. He was a professor by trade, but he didn't want to narrow his audience and just write for a tiny little uh, history association of professors and words and language and sentences that only 2,000 people could read or would be forced to read. He wanted to write for a, a public audience. And so A People's History of the United States, uh, he wrote in a way that everyone could read, high school students, college students, uh, precocious eighth graders. And it has sold to, uh, you know, two million copies by now. That was his goal, to reach as many people as possible. And so what did our great teacher teach us? I think that's what we should reflect on today. And we heard some of that in, in the great little film strip that Karen put together, and thank you for that. Uh, what we heard uh, and what he taught us, first and foremost, is that the history of the United States is a history of class struggle. Uh, Howard Zinn was a Marxist, but he liked to quote Karl Marx saying, even I'm not a Marxist. So he, he was a non-sectarian socialist and Marxist, but he understood there were classes with different interests, that there were those who had the money and the power, and there were the rest of us. And uh, they would lord it over us, but the rest of us weren't just oppressed, weren't just victims, but were actually agents, agents of our own liberation. And that we have more power than we think we have a lot of times. And they have less power than they think they have. Their hold on power is a lot more fragile than they think. And so, writing in 1999 about Seattle, he said that was a flash of the possible. And that when those of us get together at the grassroots and no longer consent to be abused by those who have the power, that their power, uh, which seemed so insurmountable, 
that even the richest corporations and the most powerful militaries in the world can't continue with business as usual. That is an empowering message, a really radical, empowering message. And as we heard in the film strip, he talked, of course, uh, about war, that there's no such thing as a just war, that all wars, even those that start off with a so-called just cause, end up being cruel and unjustifiable. And he did say that there are a thousand possibilities between passivity and acquiescence on the one hand and going to war on the other, and that if we are smart uh, homo sapiens, that we should explore all those thousand possibilities in between passivity and violence and war. Uh, he had no illusions about the United States and this question of whether we should have big government or not. He taught us that since the Constitutional Convention, we've had a big government. The only question is big government for whom? Is it a big government for the slaveholder? Is it a big government for uh, the uh, Exxon Mobiles of this world or the Goldman Sachs of this world? Is it a big government for the top 5% of this country or is it a big government for the rest of us? And is government going to work for us or is it government going to work for them? So this, this was a profound message too. And he was always asking of policy, who benefits, who loses? Because he understood that there are classes who benefit and classes who lose. And that's a, a way we should examine policy in this country, and too often we don't examine policy that way. One of his most radical teachings was that we should forsake patriotism, forsake nationalism. Put away your flags, he told us. Don't stand for the national anthem. Don't sing those patriotic songs. Don't put your hand across your chest for the Pledge of Allegiance. Don't pledge allegiance. He was an international humanist. He took very seriously the assertion that all people are created equal, and therefore he didn't think Americans were superior to everybody else. He didn't think people in the third world had less of a claim on justice or a decent standard of living than we do. And so he was in solidarity with people all across the world, not just in solidarity with people inside our borders or people inside our borders who happen to be citizens. That's not how he drew his lines of allegiances, and that's not how we should draw our lines of allegiances. He also uh, taught us that uh, there is power in culture. He was a well-rounded, he was a real lovable leftist. I think that's why so much of us, so many of us are in such mourning today because he was such a, a well-rounded uh, human being, such a lovable lefty. Uh, he understood that the, the artist and the poet and the singer and the playwright and the actor uh, can have uh, so much more influence on thousands upon thousands of people than than those of us who just write the cold porridge of prose. And so he saluted the artists and the writers and the poets and the actors uh, and the playwrights. He himself was a playwright, Marx and Soho, or his Emma Goldman play. His wife was an artist, Roz, who uh, predeceased him by a, a year and a half. Uh, but he also ultimately, in my opinion, one of the reasons uh, we loved him so much was that he taught us how to act and how to live and how to be. Uh, he wrote something uh, for the progressive about Eugene Victor Debs, the great socialist in the early part of the 20th century who, who he revered. And he said of Debs that Debs was a, a lovable leftist, that Debs was the epitome of what a radical, what an anarchist, what a socialist should be. And what was that epitome? He was fierce in his convictions, but he was kind and compassionate to his fellow human beings. And Zinn wrote that not only to extol Eugene Victor Debs, but to remind himself and to recite his own mantra and to remind all of us about how we should be fierce in our principles, kind and compassionate to other people. Uh, when um, Kurt Vonnegut died, Kurt Vonnegut and Zinn were friends, and when Kurt Vonnegut died, I asked Howard to write a column for the progressive on Kurt Vonnegut. They were both served in World War II. They saw the horrors of World War II. They became uh, pacifists of a kind, though Howard always left a little corner uh, on the, uh, or an exit door from the pacifist philosophy, so uh, in case there needed to be a, a small act uh, that could prevent something much nastier from happening. He was a man of absolutes, truly. Um, and so he went and saluted Vonnegut. And in, in this uh, piece that he wrote about Kurt Vonnegut, he found in one of Vonnegut's own works a little passage. And the passage was a woman comes up to Vonnegut and says, how come you, know, you spend all this time 
writing? Why, why are you a writer? Why do you think it makes sense? Why is it worth it? And Vonnegut told this woman, I write so that people like you can feel less alone. And that was the quote that Howard chose. And then he followed it up with a line, he said, what could be a more important achievement than making millions and millions of people feel less alone? And that's what Howard Zinn did. You know, he made us feel less alone. He made us feel less ignorant. He made us feel less powerless. And uh, we have him to thank for all that, though I have to say on this day, I feel a little lonely. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Mike Konopaki. I draw labor cartoons, and I had the distinct privilege of illustrating Howard's book, A People's History of American Empire. I want to thank Wart and Rainbow and the Progressive and the A.E. Haven Center for putting this on because many of us here were personally touched by Howard, and this is a great tribute to him, and thank you for coming. Um, the interesting thing about is if you heard him speak, if you uh, went to any of his lectures, or even if you, um, you know, read his writings, you, know, you found out that Howard was not only a great storyteller, but he was just a beautiful human being. And the interesting thing is, is you could kind of tell how people approached him when he died by looking, reading the uh, obituaries. How many of you heard the obituary on NPR where they had this uh, horrible uh, David Horowitz? Because, of course, NPR has to be fair and balanced, right? <laughs> so there's absolutely nothing in Howard Zinn's intellectual output that is worthy of any kind of respect Horowitz declared, Zinn represents a fringe mentality which has unfortunately seduced millions of people at, at this point in time. So he did certainly alter the consciousness of millions of younger people for the worst. It's so good to feel seduced by Howard Zinn. <laughs> but the beauty, the beauty of it comes through when you, when you read the words of a real humanitarian like Bob Herbert in the New York Times. And Bob starts out by saying, I had lunch with Howard Zinn just a few weeks ago, and I've seldom had more fun while talking about so many matters that were unreservedly unpleasant. The sorry state of government and politics in the U.S., the tragic futility of our escalation in Afghanistan, the plight of working people in an economy rigged to benefit the rich and the powerful. I always wondered why Howard Zinn was considered a radical. He called himself a radical. He was an unbelievably decent man who felt obliged to challenge injustice and unfairness wherever he found it. What was so radical about believing that workers should get a fair shake on the job, that corporations have too much power over our lives and much too much influence with the government, that wars are so murderously destructive that alternatives to warfare should be found, that blacks and other racial and ethnic minorities should have the same rights as whites, that the interests of powerful political leaders and corporate elites are not the same as those of the ordinary people who are struggling from week to week to make ends meet. Now why did Herbert write that? Well, besides being a humanitarian himself, he had a personal experience with Howard Zinn. And he discovered that this was just, not only was he just a beautiful human being, he was uh, a great teacher, but he was just really a nice guy. So the hatred and the vitriol that you get from the right wing is because they don't have any faith in humanity. I mean, Howard was a real human being. And that's something we should all celebrate because he's brought in so much uh, to our lives. And uh, I mean, he's, he was just a great guy. And so what I want to do is tell, just read really short a little story about where Howard came from. And he wrote a book, his autobiography called uh, You Can't Be Neutral on a Moving Train. And in a, a chapter called Growing up class conscious, Howard writes, go ahead. I grew up in the slums of Brooklyn during the Great Depression. We were poor but never hungry. My father was Eddie Zinn. He was one of four boys and had four sons. He raised us on bear hugs. How, how are you? Go to the store with your mother. My mother was Jenny Zinn, also a Jewish immigrant, and she was the brains of the family. And so she, gets a, she gives an IOU to the, to the vendor, and, she, and he says, thanks, Mrs. Zinn. We were poor, but never hungry. We survived with the help of neighborhood saviors. 
Mrs. Zinn, the doctor will see Howie now, like the doctor who cured my rickets without charging. It was not always enough. I never knew my older brother. On a cheap family vacation in the country, he died from spinal meningitis. For my parents, the ride home was an eternity. But one day, my father took me to buy a used radio. We marched home proud and happy. In August of 1927, the radio broadcast disturbing news. Today in Boston, Sacco and Vanzetti were executed. Well, when I initially drew this panel, it, I made it look like Howard was listening to the radio, and Howard said to me, Mike, I was five years old. I had no idea what was going on, so get that out of there. <laughs> so we're going to skip the Sacco and Vanzetti, but then we're going to go to Street Smarts, because now Howard tells the story about how he learned to love reading. My real education started when I found something glittering on the street. It was a book with a, with a gold cover. Tarzan and the Jewels of Opar by Edgar Rice Burroughs. The first 10 pages were missing, but I didn't care. I was hooked. <laughs> Again came the soft sound of padded footsteps in the reeds. Closer this time, Werper abandoned his design. Before him stretched the wide plain and escaped. The jewels were in his possession. To remain longer was to risk death at the hands of Tarzan or the jaws of the hunter creeping ever nearer. The New York Post offered a complete set of Charles Dickens. My parents bought them for some coupons and a few pennies. I read them all. And then he would write that his uh, apartments, every apartment he lived in in Brooklyn had cockroaches. Doggone cockroaches. Dickens stirred in me an anger at arbitrary power, puffed up with wealth and kept in place by law. What an excellent example of the power of dress young Oliver Twist was. But now that he was enveloped in the old calico robes which had grown yellow in the same service, he was badged and ticketed and fell into his place at once. A parish child, the orphan of a workhouse, the humble half-starved drudge to be cuffed and buffeted through the world, despised by all and pitied by none. Most of all, Dickens made me feel compassion for the poor, but I didn't see myself as poor in the way Oliver Twist was. Gotcha. <laughs> I had my family, my mother's food, my father's bear hugs, and my books. What child who is loved knows he's poor? There were no other books in the house. My father never read a book. My mother read romance magazines. They both read newspapers. Soon I was reading the newspaper every day. My father was a member of Local 2, Waiters Union. Other waiters called him Charlie Chaplin because of the way he walked. On a busy New Year's Eve, waiters' sons helped their fathers. I borrowed his old tux. I tried to keep up as Eddie cleaned his tables. I hated it. All his life, he worked hard for very little. I've always resented statements of politicians, media commentators, corporate executives who talk of how, in America, if you worked hard, it would become, you would become rich. The meaning of that was if you were poor, it was because you hadn't worked hard enough. Well, I knew that was a lie about my father and about millions of others, men and women who worked harder than anyone, harder than financiers and politicians, harder than anybody if you accept that when you work at an unpleasant job, that makes it very hard work indeed. In those years, I played basketball on Bushwick Avenue with some older boys. The most intense players I noticed were the communist boys. <laughs> they talked to everybody about politics. Even me, we argued over the Russian invasion of Finland. One evening, they invited me to something called a demonstration in Times Square. We took the subway. So Leon, where's the demonstration? Just wait, 10 o'clock. At exactly 10 p.m., hundreds of marchers unfurled banners and chanted slogans. Leon and I were walking behind two women carrying a banner. Hey, Howard, let's give them a hand. So we both took an end of the banner. I felt like Charlie Chaplin in modern times when he casually picks up a red signal flag and suddenly finds a thousand people marching behind him with raised fists. <laughs> Suddenly, I heard screams and saw policemen breaking up the demonstration with clubs and horses. I was astonished, bewildered. This is America. We were free to demonstrate. We had the Bill of Rights. We had democracy. Crack! I woke up perhaps a half hour later with a painful lump on my head. From that moment on, I was no longer a liberal, a believer in the self-correcting character of democracy. I was a radical, believing something was fundamentally wrong with this country.
pictures add a lot to words. And uh, Mike Konopaki did a, a marvelous job with that book. He brought Zinn to life in an astonishing way. The script writing was mainly by a guy named Dave Wagner, who led the newspaper strike in the 70s. And uh, Madison was blacklisted for his uh, contribution and never got a byline in a newspaper again. Uh, and uh, it, it fell to me to put these characters together and to make one contribution, which was to uh, take this, these stories from Howard Zinn's autobiography and say that we should add them to the adaptation of uh, a people's history of American, uh, uh, of American history because uh, it uh, uh, demanded a protagonist. Uh, the narrative wanted someone to step forward out of the frame of of the panels of the comic and say, this is what I'm talking about and this is uh, how you can understand this, folks. And of course, that was Zinn right to the letter. So uh, all uh, thanks to, uh, to, to Mike Konopaki and, and to Dave Wagner and other people that worked on the book. Um, some of you may know that I, I wrote a biography of William Appleman Williams with a, a, a student of Harvey Goldberg's. Edward Rice Maximin, and, uh, and I'd been a student of William Appleman Williams. So uh, in a way, that's where I began. Howard, of course, uh, uh, built up a, a tremendous uh, warmth uh, for Madison and, and Madison for him. And I want to connect that uh, from the angle of what Madison had to say to Howard. Uh, most of you know that uh, historical study in opposition to empire, in opposition to the American empire, was actually centered in Madison for several generations. It could be uh, said it started with Charles Beard, who, who showed uh, long ago as America's most popular historian right to this very day that even the Constitution was based in uh, arguments over property. But uh, uh, the critique of empire climaxed uh, none better uh, to this day than uh, William Appleman Williams. Uh, who proudly called himself a member of the Madison School. Uh, the Madison had a school of radical historians, uh, but we must say that Howard was a school all to himself. How could that be? Uh, well, uh, to come back to a familiar theme of tonight and not to spend too much time on it, uh, these Madison historians who, who we could talk about, almost uh, all of them gone before anybody in this room uh, came to school uh, back in the 40s and early 50s. They all meant to be public historians. One of them went down to the square during the McCarthy days and tried to get people to sign the Declaration of Independence by taking off the banner and had very little luck with it. Uh, it seemed too dangerous a document. Um, uh, but they, they wanted a public, they worked for a public, and uh, they succeeded to some small degree, but they did not have the skills for broadening the audience into thousands into hundreds of thousands and into millions. Howard had that skill in writing and speaking, none better. What was his secret? Everyone here who heard him speak has some sense that he had a moral gravity, that when he began to speak, his voice might be softened with age, but you could hear a pin drop in the room. Every listener was on tiptoes sitting down. He was about to deliver a thunderbolt from the sky not by shouting, but by the moral imperative of his message. In fact, I've only heard one uh, orator in my life who uh, compares with him was uh, another mentor of mine named C.L.R. James, the last great Pan-African leader who taught revolutionaries in the 30s how to overthrow the colonial governments in Africa, and spoke in Madison a couple times, a very elderly man, about 1970. Uh, he was pale, he was thin, uh, pale is the wrong word, he was gray, ashen, uh, although uh, his native skin was jet black. He was from Trinidad. But when he stood up to speak, suddenly the blood rushed to his face. He became uh, uh, visibly darker. And when he began to speak, all of the weakness, including the palsy in his hands, all seemed to disappear. And he spoke with this kind of moral authority. He was sort of like uh, W.B. Du Bois, uh, come back to life. His memory of, of Pan-Africanism went so far back that he himself was living history. Uh, uh, that became Howard as well in his later decades. He was living history. Everybody knew what he had done uh, in the South in the 1950s. Uh, even those who didn't know anything about his, his uh, uh, life as a, a young radical in the 30s or his service in World War II and, and so on and so forth, 
he, he was somebody who embodied so much of uh, uh, the history of the U.S. In the, in the middle of the 20th century that he looked back on it as if it had happened a very long time ago and summed it up in his very being. Howard was also a brilliant writer, and I confess that like a number of other people who got PhDs in history, it took me a long time to actually get to that first book of his, a, an award-winning biography of Fiorello LaGuardia, the, the mayor of New York. Uh, it, it, it made his career in an academic sense. It's a very close study of a greatly admired uh, liberal politician and showed that when he wanted to, when he needed to, he, he could be the very best as a, a skilled and trained historian. Um, but most of us, I would say, uh, uh, picked up his book, Snick, the New Abolitionists, uh, which uh, came out in the early to mid-1960s and it came out of a very intense personal experience in the civil rights movement. So he, he was writing about history, but he was writing about history in a very present or present a sense and uh, I might say that when he spoke about the present, he also was looking ahead to the future. He had a way of pulling these things together so that you could see the process of history moving along uh, as he spoke. Uh, uh, and again, I think that C.L.R. James is the only other person I can imagine who did that. In my mind, uh, despite the fact that the people's history is this uh, uh, three million seller, uh, he once observed to me, among others, he was very surprised. He didn't think it was uh, his uh, uh, most likely book or even necessarily his best book. It hit a chord. Uh, it was the book that was needed. But to me, the most remarkable book probably was a little thing called uh, Vietnam, the Case for Withdrawal. But why was it so remarkable? Because it was published as a, an enlarged pamphlet and sold at anti-war demonstrations. Uh, in the Boston area and every place else he spoke, people would buy tens of copies, hundreds of copies. Ultimately, there might be a thousand copies sold at a demonstration for 50 cents or a dollar, whatever it was sold for. It was a, a, a kind of a living testament to what a public historian could possibly do. He could explain everything so clearly. His message was always about the mendacity of the ruling class and, and the capacity of ordinary people to change the world. Uh, I think uh, Matt already elaborated uh, perfectly well that, that uh, Zinn had a way of saying that no matter how gloomy things seem at the moment, uh, something could happen, something could leap out of history. And that makes the understanding of history dynamic. Uh, uh, some Marxists would say dialectical, rather than static and flat, as we so often read in the New York Times and other places. Uh, Neoconservatives uh, scoffed at him, uh, uh, following the example, not so much actually of old time isolationist paleoconservatives, as they're now called, because in truth in Madison, uh, Howard Zinn actually made contact with the isolationist tradition, going back to World War I and the founding of the Capital Times. Uh, a, a sense that uh, a country didn't need to conquer other places in order to be a, a decent place to live. Um, it was the Hawk liberals following Harry Truman who probably hated Howard's in the most, at least through most of my experience with him, uh, because it was their vision of a comprehensive and permanent militarization, armed occupation across the world by U.S. forces, and of endless small wars that never seem small to the civilians or even to the soldiers. That's our great irony and one appreciated by no one more than Zinn or William Appleman Williams. Sarah Palin is out in the open with a kind of imperial madness, but Hillary Clinton is not so really particularly subtle either. Zinn envisioned a peace constituency that reached far beyond those considering themselves on the left. Uh, and uh, far beyond uh, uh, liberals and the fairly comfortable middle class, in which I include most of us tonight, but also people who were in the military and people who thought of themselves as conservatives, but were wrenched in the gut by what's happening. Zinn's moral power cut across so many barriers, and he never let himself be deluded about empire, even in moments that seemed to many of us, seemed to him as well, to be triumphs of great progressive importance, that is, the 2008 elections. 
To the last day, therefore, Howard raised questions about uh, Barack Obama's foreign policy as it got further and further from the promises at election time, or what we wish to hear. Uh, and uh, and uh, liberals believing in empire became predictably angry at Howard. Why couldn't he see that the latest invasion and occupation was really benevolent and so very different from Vietnam or other things that might be considered to be errors, understandable errors, but errors, miscalculations in essence. He, his critics knew why, of course, but they were being mean-spirited in their attacks on him from Newsweek to the New Republic to the New York Times. William Appleman Williams, to come back to Madison's mentor, looked carefully at the minds of the ruling group, group and what they said candidly about foreign policy when they were speaking among themselves. There's a great book called uh, Empire is a Way of Life. It's a little book. It's the last book he wrote when he was really broken in spirit, not being able to change things in America. But you read it today and you see the, the quintessence of what Williams was trying to, to, to make uh, about empire. The point of it all, of course, was protection of property, mostly corporate property, and had been so since at least the middle of the 19th century, long before communism, long before terrorists, and long before all the rest of today. It went on being the same, uh, and Williams had an understanding of the problem at hand. I like to think that Howard had the solution. Thank you. I'm really honored to be here, and as I walked in the room tonight, I, I, I felt something kind of relax. It feels really good to be in a room full of people who care about Howard Zinn and who identify with his life, and something that I've been holding very tight world um, events kind of, kind of loosened. Um, I'm going to talk tonight about a people's history, partly because that's the way that I encountered Zinn when I was in graduate school. Um, it was published in 1980 when I was in high school. Can you still hear me? OK, I sound different to me now. The, whoa. Um, uh, when I was in high school, um, it was not assigned to me in college. It was not assigned to me in graduate school, but grad students were passing it around. Um, and uh, it's my contention that this is a visionary book. It was released 4,000 copies in the first printing, um, but it went on to sell over 2 million copies. I think it's a visionary book not only for its day, but also for us today. Uh, I think it has something to teach us, and so I want to look into that a little bit. Um, the New York Times obituary that I read talked about how um, a people's history of the United States looked at groups of people that typically weren't included in the story. Slaves, abolitionists, women, laborers, um, civil rights activists, uh, and that this was what was innovative about it, but now uh, it said, you know, now these people are typically included in histories. And I think that that makes it seem that like the contribution um, that Howard Zinn made to history with that book has sort of been absorbed, that he might have been ahead of his time, but that we've all caught up with him now. And I don't think that's quite right. Um, uh, I think it's more than that. Um, two million people don't read a history book um, just because it has new information in it, no matter how vitally important that new information is. And two million people don't read a history book even if it has a really great critique. Um, just for that critique. And in fact, there were a lot of historians who had been writing, you know, Zinn's work is sort of a synthesis of a lot of work that was already out there. There were a lot of historians who were writing about labor and about African Americans and women by that time. Uh, but none of them were selling two million copies, and that's why you get some of these um, comments, I think, of uh, sour grapes by some professional historians. Um, so two million people read a book of history because it captures something in their imagination. It captures something for them personally. It gives them some kind of sense of how they can fit in the world, some kind of hope of how they can move on into the future. And so what I want to do just for a few minutes today is, is explore with you what it is about that book that does that. Um, and I think it, the answer to that lies in this concept, the people. Um, now, that, that sounds very simple, right? Who, nobody knows, here needs to you know, go to a dictionary to figure out what the definition of the people is. But I think it's really actually very complicated. To, so, so to use the language that I would use over in the humanities building, 
I'm going to take a few minutes to um, theorize the category of the people as, as it is utilized by Howard Zinn um, and, and get into, I think, um, what is subversive and powerful about that. So first, it's easier to start by saying what the people for Howard Zinn is not. It's not the people of the preamble of the Constitution, we the people. Zinn actually talks about this in the book. Um, he points out that the writers of the Constitution pretended that the government stood for everyone with that, with that phrase, and they hoped that people would buy it and identify their interests with the government. This in a polity where only white men of property could vote, this coming from founders, founding fathers who amongst themselves were talking about how are we going to prevent a faction, a majority faction from taking over the country. So Zinn is very clear, do not confuse the people with the government who claims to speak for you. Now Zinn also when he wrote A People's History uh, was not considering the corporation to be a person. Now this, yeah. This might seem obvious to us here, but clearly the Supreme Court has ratified the 19th century laws that's, that uh, declared that the corporation could have the rights of individual persons, a defilement of the 14th Amendment that granted um, African Americans citizenship. The myth we're supposed to swallow today is that the corporation will stand for the, pre for the people and that privatization will restore what's been so stolen from us. It's not big government that we're supposed to look for now for salvation, it's the market. But this is clearly not the people that Zinn is talking about. And I think third, Zinn was not talking about Joe the Plumber or Main Street. <laughs> Joe the Plumber and Main Street are actually the most sinister appropriation of the radical notion of the people that was coming out of the 1930s that Zinn picked up on. During the Depression, um, during the labor movements and the anti-racist movements of the Depression, um, this idea of the people was being theorized, was being uh, practiced and deployed. And Zinn picks up on that and he turns it, he interprets it, he gives it a new life. Uh, and and um, that's what is powerful about it. But by talking about Joe the Plumber then, um, you, you pull on that and you twist and pervert that notion. So Zinn's notion, we can tell the difference because Zinn's notion is not singular, representative, or normative. It is not used to sell candidates or cokes. If it's singular, I think Zinn would say, that's not it. If it's average, like Main Street, or normative, that's not it. If difference is a problem, then that's not it. Zinn's notion is capacious. It includes difference. It's profoundly coalitional. So-called deviants that you can't dress up and put on a commercial are central to it. Queers, including transgender people, people of color, including the unemployed, black people, including black men in prison, all people, all people, except for the 1% who control the country. Zinn called it the 99%. He, they're unified as a category by what he called their deep enmity of interest with that 1%. That's visionary. This 99%, the people diverse, conflicted, fighting each other, learning from each other. And one more thing is visionary. The structure of the book, I know a lot of you have read this, so you know the structure of the book goes from movement to movement to movement, group to group to group of people fighting back, of people in social movements fighting various kinds of establishments over the course of American history. Um, now, that in itself was not different because social historians that nobody was reading at the time were all creating these histories of social movements. What was visionary about Zinn is that he put them all in the same history and connected them. And so you get this feeling of the baton being passed from group to group and from generation to generation. And he said, to uncover such history is to find a powerful human impulse to assert one's humanity. 
It is to hold out, even in times of deep pessimism, the possibility of surprise. Now, we could hardly live in more dangerous times than right now, uh, but Zinn's um, uh, People's History says, no matter the power imbalance, no matter the, def the defeats that we sustain, we are many, and we fight on many fronts. What Zinn has left us with is a way grounded in history to continue to struggle. And I want to um, close by reading excerpts from two um, very short, short poems. Um, one from the 1930s by the uh, poet Carl Sandburg, who wrote the poem, The People, Yes. And I think this is a very Zinn-like poem. The people, yes, the people will live on. The learning and blundering people will live on. They will be tricked and sold and again sold and go back to the nourishing earth for footholds. In the darkness with a great bundle of grief, the people march. In the night and overhead a shovel of stars for keeps, the people march. Where to? What next? And I want to leave you with a poem by the, uh, the great poet Lucille Clifton, another visionary who died um, just this week, um, uh, coming out of the generation after the black arts movement, part of the feminist movement. And this poem is called uh, Blasting the Boats. May the tide that is entering even now, the lip of our understanding, carry you out beyond the face of fear. May you kiss the wind and then turn from it, certain that it will love you back. May you open your eyes to water, water waving forever. And may you in your innocence sail through this to that. It's wonderful to see you. Um, my name is Mary Layoun. I teach on campus in the Department of Comparative Literature. And um, I'm truly honored to be here. And when I thought, what could I possibly say? I'm not a historian. I wasn't a personal friend. I didn't have the pleasure and the honor of having lunch across the table with Howard Zinn, although I read his books. I went to his lectures. I had the honor of introducing him a couple of years ago in Madison. I want to pay tribute to Howard Zinn this evening and to recognize my wonderful colleagues and comrades and comadres who preceded me. Uh, Nan said, Howard Zinn taught us about coalitions, about people's struggles together. Matt, reminded me, although I'm a devoted reader of the progressive, Howard Zinn's comment or recounting of Vonnegut's statement, I write so you feel less alone. I didn't remember that, although I read that article. Um, but without knowing those things, I wanted to pay tribute tonight to Howard Zinn, not only for those of us whose histories he accounts for in his work, not only for those of us whose struggles he accounts for in his work, not only for the powerful and compelling impact of his books and articles, not only for the powerful and compelling impact of his person. He was, as many people have borne witness, a wonderful human being, a lovable leftist, I like the phrase. Not only for his impact as a teacher, a mentor, and an activist in the United States, I would like to pay tribute to Howard Zinn tonight for those of us whose stories he didn't tell, whose struggles he didn't account for. Maybe some of us who never heard him, but for whom, nonetheless, Howard Zinn was a shining example of a way of thinking, of a way of being in the world, for some of us of a way of being a scholar in a context in which it's a sheer miracle that we made it to universities. I want to pay tribute to that Howard Zinn, to that Howard Zinn who spoke not only of US history, although that I know was his discipline. 
not only to the Howard Zinn, who was a fearless defender of the rights of peoples around the world, but to the Howard Zinn, who made an, had an impact on people who don't even know his books, but know what he stood for, not only in the United States, but outside of it. I want to pay tribute to something that, by closing with a beloved poet, not uh, Carl Sandburg is a beloved poet too, but Lucille Clifton in my universe is an even more beloved one. Um, to, the, to something that, that runs throughout Howard Zinn's work, and that is not only the facts, the stories of a history that we often don't hear about, but the power of imagination, of imagining things otherwise. Howard Zinn, for some of us, was imagining not just the university and scholarship, but being an activist in the world otherwise. That's the Howard Zinn I'd like to pay tribute to. I want to, um, to remind us, Paul Buell said, referred to the SNCC book, that was my first book, that was the first book I read by Howard Zinn. But I want to remind us of the closing of People's History of the United States, in which Zinn urges us to imagine beyond the past and he's told it's abominable stories, beyond even the present, which is often dark, and as he puts it in the conclusion of that book, beyond a history that is often presented as empty of surprise. Into the realm, writes Zinn, of imagination, imagination that is not totally removed from history. In fact, it is in history, in the past, Zinn urges us, that we see glimpses of possibility. He writes, there is the past and its continuing horrors, violence, war, prejudices against those who are different, outrageous monopolization of the good earth's wealth by a few, political power in the hands of liars and murderers, the buildings of prisons instead of schools, 1999 was the revised edition. It could have been yesterday. But, he continues, there is also, though much of this is kept from us, to keep us intimidated and without hope, the bubbling of change under the surface of obedience. And he concludes his epilogue to that book with the statement, the prisoners of the system will continue to rebel as before, in ways that cannot be foreseen, at times that cannot be predicted. I am not a historian. I am a professor of comparative literature and not even of American literature. So in tribute to Howard Zinn, let me read to you a short poem by a great poet, by a great poetic historian even, who died over a year ago. Mahmoud Darwish. This poem is from his 200, 200, oh my God, I'm not a historian, 2005 collection, Like Almond Blossoms and More and Beyond. It's called Think of Others. As you prepare your breakfast, think of others. Don't forget to feed the pigeons. As you wage your wars, think of others. Don't forget those who want peace. As you pay the bill for your water, think of others, those who can drink only from clouds. As you return to the house, your house, think of others, those who live in tents. As you sleep and count the planets, Think of others, those who have no place to sleep. As you set yourself free with metaphors, think of others, those who have lost the right to words. As you think of distant others, think of yourself. Say, I wish. I wear a candle in the darkness. I want to pay tribute to Howard Zinn, a candle in the darkness 
for those of us whose stories he told and for those of us whose stories he didn't tell. And I want to pay tribute to all of you here this evening in his honor, in his memory, as you think of distant others. Think of yourself. Say, I wish to be a candle in the darkness. That will be the greatest tribute to Howard Zinn. Thank you. Just want to share a short anecdote, but I think very important. And uh, um, from a Native American perspective, uh, and for me personally, uh, when I read Howard Zinn, I, I like the fact that his history is not the past. His history is present. Uh, oppressed groups, especially in this country, are still affected by how this country was founded. And uh, in particular, uh, Christopher Columbus and uh, uh, Howard Zinn. And when I read Howard Zinn, I feel like these uh, still happening, these patterns of of, uh, of abuse and of subjugation, et cetera. Uh, I'm a journalist, uh, well, yeah, and uh, I have been for a while, but I'm a better journalist after working with Matt Rothschild. Three years ago, Matt asked me to write an op-ed piece about uh, Christopher Columbus. He was coming up his day in October, and I thought, oh, shit, I'm so sick of writing about thinking about Christopher Columbus. <laughs> I mean, how many times can you kick a dead guy? Uh, you know, we, uh, we all know what a what a creep he was, and uh, and so like a lot of uh, things, I was, was trying to think of new things. And Matt finally suggested, you know, why don't we quote from Howard Zinn? He he had some good uh, details about Columbus, who sent uh, indigenous Caribbean slaves off to uh, Europe and uh, cut the hands off of. Uh, native slaves if they didn't bring enough gold and uh, those who fled were chased down by dogs and, and killed and mutilated and all this sort of stuff and I thought it added a great deal to the piece and in fact Matt, Matt probably thought I was joking but I was serious when I said Matt we need a double byline uh, me and uh, Howard Zinn and that's an ego thing for me more than anything I just want to be right up there with Howard Zinn. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but you know after when I was a kid, uh, Christopher Columbus was a hero, and then I got older and realized he you know, wasn't a hero. And today's younger generation, of course, uh, you know, now gets a more balanced picture of, uh, of Christopher Columbus. But I, why I say Howard Zinn's history still matters, why it's still so in the present is, is even today when I was looking over that column, which you can find archived at theprogressive.org, I, uh, uh, I was, I was moved on a very personal native kind of feeling, you know, that uh, knowing that my ancestors uh, uh, were, uh, Columbus opened this door for massive uh, colonization and genocide, and native people are still affected by that, as every press group is, and it's quite moving, and I, I just, when I think of that book, People's History, I think that's, that's so fluid, it's so alive, and it still resonates, and still sells 100,000 copies a year, um, and uh, one, so I think that's probably the best thing I could say about Howard Zinn on a personal level and, uh, and that it matters for people to know the details of, uh, because you know, I find, Matt would tell you this too, that when I <laughs> write about native issues sometimes and we get a lot of weirdos who write back and get mad for, you know, bringing up the past and why can't you get over it? And uh, yeah, I'll get over it as soon as you understand what it is I'm supposed to get over. Those details matter. They really matter. And um, so I just want to close with one thought. I, I, I saw a headline the other day that said, uh, it's this new uh, study that's out, uh, new research that says happy people live longer than miserable people, I guess. <laughs> And Howard Zinn lived a full, full life, obviously, it seems. And I ran across a quote from one of his former colleagues at Boston University. And uh, he said, Howard Zinn was a happy warrior. And I'm sure that was, had a great deal to his longevity. And I love the fact that uh, the synchronicity of warrior, a happy warrior, Howard Zinn. Thank you very much. War could not be accepted, no matter what. what the, no matter what. Well, yeah, 
you know, no matter what the reasons given, the excuse given, liberty, democracy, this, that, you know, no, war, war is by its, by definition, the indiscriminate killing of huge numbers of people for ends which are uncertain. If you think about means and ends, you think about that ethical proposition in, and apply it to war, the means are horrible, certainly. The end is uncertain. Uh, that alone should make you hesitate. And then, of course, people always ask the question, I've always, this question has always been asked of me, and so I'm, I'm going to uh, preempt your asking it, <laughs> even in your head. <laughs> yeah, but what else were we to do? This is what people ask. What else are we to do about this, about that, about independence from England, about, about slavery? And, you know. By the way, an interesting thing about slavery, John Brown wanted to free the slaves. <laughs> this is a year before the Civil War, right? He tries to start, wasn't very good at it, but he tried to start a slave insurrection, hoping that would, you know, it would, be, it would spread and spread and spread. Maybe they'd end slavery that way. He's executed by the government of the United States and the state of Virginia for using such violence. <laughs> the next year, they start a war which ends up with 600,000 dead, and everybody is celebrating that slavery is ended in that way. Well, uh, well, yeah, just one point I want to make. This is the question that says, what else would you do? And they say, what else? Yeah, but Hitler, you had to do something. Had something about Hitler. I agree, you had to do something about all these things. You had to do something about winning independence if you're oppressed. You have to do something about slavery if there's slavery. You have to do something about fascism. You have to do something about all these things. But you don't have to do war. Yeah. You're there. You have to, if, if we have any brains, I don't know if we do, <laughs> but it, are we are supposed to be smart. We are smart in so many ways. Surely we should be able to understand that in between war and passivity, there are a thousand possibilities. You see.